All right, let's just record it. Go. All righty. Kia ora koutou. My name is Axel Wilke. Thanks uh, everybody for coming along tonight. I'm going to talk to you about my thoughts on the uh, Northern Corridor and the Downstream Effects Management Plan. I'd like to start with a health warning though. This presentation really does challenge the status quo. We, and by that I mean the royal we, all of us, we need to change. Because business as usual just isn't an option any longer, and I'll explain to you why that is. Change needs to happen at an institutional level. There are things necessary that we as individuals can't enact. But change needs to happen at an individual level as well. And I do appreciate that change can be hard. You may experience some resistance. People often have fear of the unknown when things change. And it might even go as far as you perceiving a loss when I'm talking about having to let go of long-held privileges or benefits. And uh, I'd like you to be mindful as I go through this presentation. When those emotions come up in you, and you listen to what I have, what I have to say. You might wonder why I ask you, but how close can you park to Cathedral Square on a public road all day long for free? Anybody got any ideas? Two kilometers. Two kilometers. No, it's a bit closer. A K? One K? No, that's still a bit too far. 200 meters? Not quite. The correct answer is 430 meters. Yeah. 430 meters is the closest spot just next to Latimer Square outside the club where you can park for free all day long. You just have to be there early enough in the morning. And I'll come back to you why I'm asking you this question. The Northern Arterial has obviously been around for a very long time. The idea, the original idea was conceived in 1960. And what's on the screen here is the uh, 1964 version, where the Northern Arterial was going to go all the way through the central city um, to link up with a southern motorway to be built right through the industrial area of Sydenham. And so the um, CBD alignment of the Northern Arterial was halfway between Madras Street and Barbados Street and it was supposed to be an elevated motorway. Now you see other elements um, of the 1964 idea on the screen and this connection from the end of Fendleton Road uh, to the end of Salisbury Street uh, straight across North Hackley Park is actually something that was already under construction at the late, in the late 60s um, when the then mayor who favoured that project got biffed out by the uh, new incoming mayor. <laughs> so there's been a long history of the community not being too fond of these ideas. And the Northern Arterial is just one of dozens of projects, big roading projects, that have been lying around in drawers for decades. And it was the last government 
then pulled the drawers open and dusted off the planes. And they called this initiative Roads of National Significance. And what all these projects had in common was they made little to no economic sense, <laughs> which is why they had been lying in drawers for decades. Mm -hmm. And National got underway with those projects. And that's why I usually call those projects Roads of Significance to National. <laughs> So the present situation um, is that the Northern Corridor has more or less been built. Um, we just seem to be carry on with business as usual. There's more demand for driving, so let's build more roads. And so what has been built, so the Northern Arterial project has over the decades been scaled back and now the project is supposed to finish at Innes Road, so the section from Innes Road to Curie to Drive. The Christchurch City Council is delivering that and north of Curie to Drive it's the New Zealand Transport Agency that is in charge. Uh, that latter section is supposed to open in 15 months time. But what will the traffic do when it hits in this route? For that reason, Christchurch City is currently consulting on what they should do to deal with the downstream effects. Seems to be a little bit um, the roundabout way uh, to do to start thinking about what to do, how to mitigate the, the um, negative effects when that thing is just about to open. Mm. There's about 15 million programmed to deal with these downstream effects. So the last time we did a project like that in Christchurch, that was the Southern Motorway. And at a basic level, the Southern Motorway is four lanes of traffic uninterrupted flow. And where the motorway finishes and uh, links into an urban arterial road, Brown Street, there's still four lanes of traffic, but now the flow is interrupted by traffic lights. About a third of the time is being taken up by the signals to give the side streets a go. The result of that? Brown Street is for three hours every day Christchurch's biggest car park. Mm. So the Northern Arterial, we also have four lanes of uninterrupted flow. And that's trying to fit into a two-lane arterial route that is interrupted by traffic lights. <laughs> now, as part of the downstream work, um, one of the considerations is to put um, clear racing for the peak traffic demand. But, uh, yeah, doesn't work with the southern motorway. And I'm wondering whether somebody has really thought this through, mm -hmm. whether this is even going to work. <laughs> mm. But looking again at the big picture, we have really strong population growth in Greater Christchurch. And in round numbers, every 10 years, every decade, we can expect to have an additional 100,000 population, an additional 90,000 cars on the roads, and we need an additional 40,000 houses for those people to live somewhere. And here I've highlighted the scary part. Mm. 90,000 additional cars. Car person almost. Every 10 years. 180,000 cars 
in 20 years, 270,000 cars in 30 years. Mm -hmm. We could not physically fit that many cars into Greater Christchurch once a decade if we tried. We will have to reduce the amount of car-based travel. There just is no alternative to that. And there's also the thing of climate change, another reason to change our business as usual approach. Kiwis love their cars, right? Canterbury has the third highest rate of car ownership in New Zealand much higher, significantly higher, than the Auckland or Wellington regions. There are 913 cars for every 1,000 population in Canterbury. Mm. Whereas in the other two big centers, that figure sits around 700 cars per 1,000 population. I suggest to you that Christchurch's lack of rapid transit is the main factor explaining this automobile dependence. We've had decades of car-centric planning and the outcomes are that we have a significantly higher rate of car ownership and resulting car usage than the other two big centers in New Zealand. It's just too easy. The takeaway message from this is we get the outcomes that we accommodate. Mm. On Monday, we had one of our passenger rail workshops, passenger rail for Canterbury, and uh, the Minister of Transport and Minister of Housing and Urban Development, the Honourable Phil Twyford, spoke to us um, via Skype. And what he told us, and most people in the audience were not aware of that, is that his task, rather recently, his task, the New Zealand Transport Agency and our regional council, ECAN, to come up with plans to reduce car-based trips and to increase the use of sustainable transport modes. The Northern Arterial, of course, achieves the exact opposite <laughs> of that. So, there seems to be some disconnect here. We changed the government in 2017 and we have since been carrying on with the last government's agenda which is doing the exact opposite from what the current government would like us to do. Is this perhaps because we have such split responsibilities with this project, where there's the New Zealand Transport Agency building the corridor north of, uh, north of QE2 Drive, the City Council building everything south of QE2 Drive, and the Regional Council being in charge of organizing public transport. Is there actually anybody in charge of all? I ask you, can we change how people from north of the Wymac or from the northern parts of Christchurch will travel? And I suggest to you, yes we can, and we can achieve those things rather quickly. But what is key to this is collaboration within, between those agencies that are involved. It can the Transport Agency, the City Council, Rheinland District also needs to come on board 
um, if there are some public transport measures involved, uh, they provide the bus stops and uh, I suggest to you that the science and engineering is doing things different is rather easy. The hard part is that it needs some political will to change tech. I have developed a workable proposal with several components for the St. Albans Residents Association and those people in the area who are rather upset about what is going to happen to them in 15 months time and there are several elements to that proposal. The first one is I suggest we should have a new bus route that is a limited stop service that comes from Rangiora and Kayapoi. It is shown on this map as the blue line um, pulls into uh, Kayapoi and then um, travels on the northern arterial all the way down to Edgeware Road into the central city via Manchester Street. There is, in fact, a blue line doing that journey up to Rangiora, but that line is currently using Papanui Road and Maynoth Road. So if we pull that blue line onto the motorway, then the other route that runs the whole length, the uh, route shown in red, that would have to be increased in frequency, um, at least from Belfast south. For something like this to work, that blue line would need to run rather frequently to be attractive. And I suggest 10 minutes, a bus every 10 minutes at a maximum. The second part of my suggested proposal is we need bus priority measures and I suggest we should have bus lanes that are in place and apply permanently 24-7 over the whole length of the northern arterial where the bus is using it. Where those bus lanes go down on Cranford Street all the way to Edgeware Road. And in order for the bus to be fast, it should be a limited um, stop service. And for the bus then to not get stuck in traffic on Manchester Street, there need to be measures in place that reduce the demand for driving on Manchester Street. And that could, for example, be a bus gate at Billy Avenue, or we could uh, close Manchester Street at the river, for example. There's two reasons for the bus lanes and for the bus lanes to be permanent. Reason number one, we need competitive travel times for the bus. And if the bus lanes are in place, I guarantee you that the bus will get you into the central city from north of the Wymac faster than driving during the peaks. Mm. Second reason, having two bus lanes on the northern arterial reduces the available number of traffic lanes to two, rather than the four that are currently planned. So that puts a lid on the number of cars that can arrive into St. Albans while the Northern Motorway it basically doesn't increase the capacity of what Cranford Street currently has and so it puts a natural constraint in place. Four lanes deliver twice as much traffic than two lanes can. We don't want that. The third part of the proposal is, and that's 
when it gets maybe a little bit tricky, <laughs> I suggest we need to charge for parking, much more so than what we currently do. Now I see there is um, two distinctly different components to parking. Firstly, we ought to provide parking right, uh, mostly north of the uh, Rymac, I would suggest. And uh, they do this a lot in Auckland, on the northern busway, for example. They've got park and ride stations all along, and they made the brave mistake of making those parks free. And there are more people driving there because it's free than need to. There's lots of people who would have alternatives, mm. but because it's free, it skews it for them towards driving there rather than biking the there problem. or... Uh, mm -hmm. taking, a, uh, taking a bus um, to um, the uh, park and ride station or walking there. Mm -hmm. So and they have great problems in Auckland to now go back um, to start charging for parking because uh, people don't like that. <laughs> You're taking something away from them that they got used to. But mm -hmm. at many park and ride stations, at, at some it's so bad, after 6.30 a.m. the thing is full. So what does that help you if you have no alternative to driving but you only need to be there at 9am? Do you go there two and a half hours earlier? So we need to have park and ride and I suggest we should build that close to where we will have future railway stations along the main north line when we get passenger rail. But we should start charging for these park and ride stations from day one. The second component is we also need to charge for parking much more so than we currently do um, where people drive to. For example, the central city or the areas around the malls or any other high parking generators, university for example. And what I've shown you here, the red fence, that is the area in the CBD outside which you can park all day for free. And you can provide the best public transport service, fast, frequent, reliable, and it would still not work. People would put up with getting stuck in traffic because there is ample free parking mm -hmm. available close to where they want to go. So therefore, the area where parking is being charged for needs to increase greatly. And I suggest at least out to cover the four avenues. That, of course, covers a lot of residential streets. And therefore, we need to have a system in place whereby local residents can buy permit, permits from the council so that they have got the right to park on their local street and don't get treated the same way as the commuters who come from far, far away. Mm -hmm. So there's two main reasons for this kind of parking management. Firstly, you start charging for parking, you dampen the demand for driving. That is what will make public transport work. Secondly, that generates a lot of revenue and that revenue can be taken to fund the public transport services. And that is exactly what they implemented in Queenstown in November 2017. They had a greatly improved public transport service funded by a much greater area of parking. Parking is obviously organized by the district council or the city council. In Queenstown's, Queenstown's case, the district council hands over the funding 
to the regional council because it's the regional council that's responsible for organizing public transport. That's how they got to do it, uh, got it to work in Queenstown. Outcome? Within a couple of months, they had nearly three times as many people wow. on their public transport in Queenstown. Mm. And on a per population basis, they use more public transport in Queenstown now than we do in Christchurch. Mm -hmm. I suggest to you that the way the City Council is running the parking management, being so permissive, with thousands of people parking all day long for free so close to the center of the city that is one of the principal reasons for the low bus use that we have in Greater Christchurch. So basically a policy decision by the Christchurch City Council stops the regional council from being successful was providing public transport. Not good enough. That needs to change. I suggest to you what we ought to do now is stop and rethink the whole thing. We need to get the key stakeholders together, the transport agency, the city council, the regional council, environment district, and they ought to agree that with whatever they do, their target should be less driving, more use of public transport. And once they've agreed on those principles, somebody can sit down and spend a little bit more time than me, you know, um, drawing something up on one weekend and work out a detailed proposal, something that might be a little bit more robust than what I've done here. And a key component to the agencies sitting down and nutting something out is, is the regional council simply does not have the funds budgeted for to um, fund another very frequent bus service coming from the north. We can't wait for a few years before they can make an allowance in their budget. It needs to be funded in 15 months time and therefore I suggest that the City Council should hand over quite a bit of funding to make this happen. Firstly, most of the downstream effects funding, the 15 million that they have set aside, will not be needed because there isn't anything that needs mitigating once you um, do what I've suggested here. And secondly, from the increased parking revenue, if they hand this over just the way they do that in Queenstown, that is an on, on an ongoing basis and that can fund that blue line that I've showed you um, on an ongoing basis. But the key point, what's needed at this point in time, is for the agencies to sit down and agree that the target ought to be less driving, more public transport use. We can't continuously say that in a few years time we will start to do things differently. Now is the time to act. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Axel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Look, so um, just uh, picking up on a couple of things that we talked about, and I know that the community will be interested in, mentioned bus gates at Beely Ave. Obviously, we also heard that this is not necessarily the finished product by any stretch of the imagination, but it's an idea about, and the key thing is, as we've said, getting people into public transport and reducing traffic. But just to go back onto the something like bus gates at Beely Ave, what would those look like? What are we talking about What would there? this look like? Yes, so you drive up Manchester Street through the central city and you come to Beely Avenue and your only option is to turn left. 
Yeah. Because only the bus can go straight through. Okay. Or you drive along Billy Avenue, you come to Manchester Street, and you can only go straight through mm -hmm. or turn left. But you can't turn right because only the buses go through the median in Billy Avenue. As simple as that. And the reason why I picked this particular intersection, mm. uh, believe it or not, it is one of the least safe intersections that we have in Christchurch. Mm. The right turn um, towards the north has a horrific crash rate. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and uh, simply removing that one right turn mm. from a road safety perspective is a very, very, very useful thing to do. Mm. There are so many people who come to grief there and uh, that by itself. Yeah. That's, why, that's why I've picked this, but there are other mm. ways um, we can deal with the demand for driving during the peaks when we really don't want to hold up the bus on Manchester Street. It doesn't have to be at Billy yeah. So the Ma Manchester Street residents won't, won't be uh, affected badly by this at all, will they? I mean, uh, essentially we're putting, if you're getting buses going down, down the street, it's going to reduce traffic as well, down Manchester Street, is that kind of how we th we're thinking there? Yeah, it would probably reduce the traffic on Manchester Street uh, compared to what is going, to happen. what is driving up, up and down, um, you know, mm. north of the central city uh, already, or, you know, anywhere from, from the center of the city to be the, mm. to be the avenue as well. Mm. Yeah, because Manchester Street isn't actually, uh, is Manchester Street included in the downstream effects management plan as a rat running no. road? So that'll be a road that will actually mm. get a lot more traffic with the increased traffic. Okay, great. Um, just also, just picking up on placing park and ride so we're going to place park and ride where future stations will be. That's a great idea. So when you're talking about the future, what are we thinking? Like with, we're thinking light rail possibly in the future, or what are what are the sort of the ideas there? The idea is um, to buy some rolling stock, which is known as tram trains, and that is basically a type of light rail. Mm -hmm. but light rail laid out in a way that it can run on a heavy rail line and mix with other heavy rail traffic. Ah, okay. Uh, being first trialled in Karlsruhe in Germany in 1982, which is why in the uh, planning world it's known as the Karlsruhe model. Okay. And the beauty of that is once you've got a light rail vehicle, you can actually leave the heavy rail corridor if and when you decide that that is useful. So we could, for example, um, have these vehicles come in from the north on the rail line as it is, and then turn onto Rickerton Avenue, stop at the hospital, go along the, the river, Kilmore mm -hmm. Street, Oh, okay. And parked and right that. outside the bus exchange. Okay. Ah. Okay. So same vehicle yeah. that comes from Emberley or yep. Rangiora or Kaiapoi or whatever can bring you right to the bus exchange. Okay. Okay. Just and like obviously, to build a spur into the city, mm. that will take time. Yeah. And that won't be cheap. No. But we could order those units now mm. and with a little bit of fluffing around and organizing funding that could be up and running in as little as two years time. I mean I, I know that I just going around the community a lot of people say we need public transport and they always say light rail or rail why haven't we got those sorts of things but we it's a stepping stone of, that's what I'm hearing from you. It's, yes. It's a stepping yes. stone. Um, there's hundreds of places around the world who, you know, sometime after the Second World War got rid of their tram systems. Yeah, like us. Like us. Yeah. Last tram, 1946, 48, something like that. Um, and 
they are reintroducing um, light rail no. um, these days, mm. or they started introducing light rail many years ago, mm. and it's always an iterative approach. You start small, and then you build out. Yep. So, just buying a couple of units and running them, you know, up and down the main nose line and the line to the south, that could be a very, very simple start. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Great. All right. I have a question, Axel. Um, council are uh, talking about a, a high, occupan high occupancy vehicle lane coming down the CNC all the way down to oh, about 500 metres short of the Cranford Street intersection. Uh, it's only southbound. Um, and then CCC are going to study putting a HOV lane down Cranford Street, Sherbourne Street, out of Yeah. Um, should we accept that as a as a option? I suggest no. Mm. For the reason that if you have a high quality bus service that runs really frequently, I'll go back to the map. Every now and then, on the motorway part of the Northern Arterial, you might actually want for the bus to stop. For example, on this overpass here, mm -hmm. where the uh, red line crosses underneath. So, you really want people to be able to transfer from one bus to the next. Mm. If you keep it simple, uh, without having to spend heaps of money making things wider and having pull out lanes and you know bus bays uh, on a road that has an 80k speed limit, um, that would cost a huge amount of money. And if we keep it simple and say, now this is for buses only, then the buses can stop in the lane on the piece of infrastructure that we've already built. So that is the reason why I have no time for HOV lanes whatsoever. Um, um, it's, it just doesn't make sense. It makes operating a high quality, very frequent bus service unnecessarily hard. Mm -hmm. Now, Auckland Transport, for example, um, is really good at communicating the underlying reasons why you shouldn't uh, do these things. And, well, they do have HOV lanes as well, but um, they have many corridors where, you know, four lane road, two lanes are for buses only, and they look empty. They look empty for most of the time mm. because there's often a few minutes between buses. Mm -hmm. And those lanes often carry 60, 65%, sometimes 70% of the number of people that travel along the road. Mm. Looks empty, highly successful. And a lot less so, pollution too. Let's keep it simple. If people want to drive, well, there's a lane for you. If people are happy to take the bus, there's a lane for you. Mm -hmm. Don't have to fluff around spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for pull-out infrastructure, resource consents, years to go before it can be done. Keep it simple. And the buses, are they... Are they what are they like the red buses that are in town? What sort of buses are you thinking that would be best put on these on these lines here? What sort of things would they have to encourage people to use them other than just being relatively cheap or well not cheap but cost effective for the user and um, in punctual what other other aspects to the bus service would would be uh, positive? The most important thing with public transport is reliability. Okay. Yep. That is the most important thing. Much more important what kind of vehicle it is, 
Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we would um, presumably use something reasonably modern if it takes off. <laughs> if there's a huge amount of demand and you don't want to run the buses more often than every 10 minutes, mm. um, Wellington has double decker buses now, Auckland has double decker buses. Yeah. We haven't got any double decker buses yet. No. The interchange has been built so that it can accommodate double decker buses. Oh, right. Has it? Yes. Oh, wow. The previous interchange. Well, that's a bit of future planning. <laughs> this one can. Good. So we will have double decker buses at some point. Yeah. And uh, I don't know um, how long it will take. Comfortable, before. clean. Yeah. And it's, it's really cool, you know. When you sit on these double deckers um, and you ride that for the first time, you go uh, at the top and sit right in front, and it's like being a tourist. It's really, really <laughs> cool just being, you know, king off the road, being four meters above everything else. Yeah, and, uh, flying past and, all those uh, cars. And yeah, <laughs> it is sweet. Okay. Great. So I guess this, maybe just to wrap it up. So, I mean, what would you be telling the people who um, uh, can make a submission um, on on this project? What would you be saying to them? Like, you know, how how can we be the most effective? How can they, how can each submitter be the most effective? I think there's five options in the uh, downstream effects management plan. Just reject them and say. Do this instead. So basically, can the plan? Okay. Well, do something useful that is future proof, that doesn't upset things in the St. Albans community, that doesn't require us to put 15 million worth of mitigation measures in place, mm. and who knows how effective those mitigation measures are in the first instance because. It's all based on the assumption that Aval will um, have to put up this 30% increase in traffic before the mitigation measures are even required. So um, it just needs to be rejected. Mm. It just doesn't make sense. You know, this is 2019. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Business as usual is over. Yeah. Axel, uh, one of the comments made to me quite a few times was um, there is some things in the in the stages that people want like some upgraded inter intersections to allow safe access for kids crossing the road elderly getting around as well there's a couple of intersections on Cranford Street that are in need of help it looks like and there's talk of ones on um, Berwick Warrington Street as well um, would it be if we said that we don't, we don't like this plan, we reject it, but we do want intersection upgrades, is that sending mixed signals or is that acceptable to um, ask for those things? It's core business of council right. to improve things if they aren't good enough. Right. So there's absolutely no inconsistency there to ask for safety upgrades or usability upgrades. Absolutely no inconsistency. Okay. This, that is core business. But but that's outside of this plan. It might well be, and yep. it might take a wee while before they get round to doing it. But it's a matter of get it on the books, get it scheduled. It'll eventually happen. Okay. All right. All right. Well, the dog's letting us know that I think it's time to wrap up. Thanks. Thank you very much, Axel. And Thank uh, you. yeah. Yeah, we'll be in contact.